let's do this. And I'm just going to make sure that oh, the mic still works all the way back here. Pretty good. Great. I'm not going to do the recording in. Uh, good morning. Thanks, everyone, for being with me here at nine o'clock. Lol. Um, so this is a talk about coping with the existential dread you get when everything kind of sucks. Right? That's, that's the opening gambit. We're going to go on, a, on a, an emotional roller coaster about how you feel when everything kind of sucks. Because we've all been there. And we've all opened up a code base. And you know that like, horrible sigh of like, oh my god, what is this? That washes over you when you open something that maybe hasn't been touched in years by someone who didn't care, who did something very, very quickly under very, very tight time constraints. And you're left trying to pick up the pieces. Um, so, yeah, this is about kind of finding hopeful nihilism and optimism in a place where things can often be painful and uncomfortable. Sounds like we're going to start a concert. So my name's David, and I spend way too much time thinking about software design. This is basically my toxic character trait. So I'm the head of architecture for a company in London called New Day. We're a credit card company, not a life coaching company, despite the name. Um, we're hiring, whatever, but really, um, I'm here to talk to you about why, why design is important in everything you do and why literally everything in the world matters, right? So the, you know, the truth is I'm a programmer and you will pry my keyboard out of my cold, dead hands. That said, there's not a lot of code in this talk, so if you think you're going to see demos, you're going to be a bit disappointed. What we're going to do is talk about how software makes us feel and how we can take those feelings we have about software design and turn them into kind of actionable things that we can do to make our code bases better. So I did this small kind of viral tweet at the end of last year when I was trying to fix up this like objectively terrible code base, and I looked at this thing and I had that sinking, horrible feeling of dread that I was describing a moment ago. And I did what I always do when I see something awful. I open Twitter and I rage tweet into the void, right? So I remember just thinking, this is a damning indictment on the state of software design in like 2022, 2023, where people can do this and think that this is design, right? It's, it's horrendous. And mostly Twitter agreed, and it was, it was good, and I got to feel vindicated in being angry at a thing. Um, basically, because organizing your code by architectural feature is like basically a hate crime. It's a hate crime that you can commit against your software. And my inner monologue was just sitting there screaming, why is this like this? What does this even do? It doesn't make any sense. So I'm hopefully going to try and explain why it is like this and how we can make it make sense. Because the truth is, that organizational pattern is like taking your classic car collection, getting your hammer out, and smashing it up and organizing it by wheels, steering wheels, seats, windshields, bonnets, and boots. Doesn't make any sense. You remove all context from a thing when you break it up into small parts. Now, so much of the talk that you'll hear about design in, in software always ends up getting dragged all the way back to work done in the 1990s about design patterns. And this isn't a talk about design patterns. So don't worry, you'd have to get up and walk out. Um, but I want to pay them a little bit of lip service so we actually understand what design patterns are before we talk about the thing that isn't design patterns. Because it might be easy to misinterpret this talk as some kind of tirade against design patterns. And it's really not. It's not a rallying cry against standards or anything like that. So most people don't actually know where design patterns come from. And it's a little bit of an interesting story. So design patterns originated in the works of a man called Christopher Alexandra, who was like a real-life architect. He built buildings, right? None of the fake architecture job titles like I have. Um, and he wrote this amazing book in the 1970s, 1960s, called, it's brilliant, Notes on the Synthesis of Form, which is definitely like my progressive metal album title, I think, at this point. And, um, and basically, a bunch of computer scientists in the 70s and 80s wrote, uh, read notes on the synthesis of form. And they started metabolizing the ideas, and it led to the design patterns movement. And they started writing books around how design patterns from architecture could be applied to computer programming languages. So the Gang of Four book here, which came out in 1994, is probably kind of the foundational text around design patterns. And what it did is it attempted to lay out a series of structural, creational, and behavioral patterns um, that were common in software at the time. 
There are a bunch of other noteworthy books that followed around this kind of pattern language thing from people like Kent Beck, who wrote Small Talk Best Practices, Martin Fowler, who wrote the very, very famous and very, very wordy Patterns of Enterprise Architecture, blah, 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 blah some subtitle, very, very good book. Um, but ultimately, the intention of all these books was good, and it targeted only one thing, and this is the thing that people often misinterpret, to provide concrete guidance around descriptions of common solutions to common problems that they had seen in software at the time, right? Hey, we looked around all the work we did, and this is the thing that was happening over and over again. It wasn't, hey, we sat in a room and we designed this pattern and we think you should fit this to all of your software, right? Very, very different intent. So what design patterns really are is giving names to model answers to model questions, right? And you know, the really, really powerful thing about language, and actually Eli's keynote yesterday really touched on this, is you give concepts names, then we can talk about them. So design patterns were really, really important in leveling up the way we spoke about the things that we observed in software. Now, this isn't a talk about any of that, because patterns try and make sense of categories of things that are all the same. And actually, I want to talk about all the things that are different in your software. Now, I suppose I kind of just lament that all of the talk of design patterns in software really devolves down into this kind of talk of design patterns, because they're the least interesting part. Like, if there's a model answer, you don't have to think about it, right? That's, that's not very interesting. They're about all the parts of your system that are familiar. So with the acceptance of that, what we actually did over the years since kind of the 70s and 80s is we, is we pushed our programming languages to innovate, to make a lot of those patterns obsolete over time. And that's quite interesting because once we did that, it kind of feels like we forgot to talk about anything that didn't fit into these well-notated patterns. And, you know, the truth is that's where real design starts, where, where the talk of patterns end. And you're just trying to find form for all of the other stuff in your system. And that's kind of the root of why people always use the joke that naming is hard, because you're trying to find form and structure for all the other stuff that doesn't fit into any of the neat boxes. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have kind of large-scale organizational patterns, things like you know, N-tier, hexagonal architectures, 12-factor apps, and all of those movements are all about trying to de describe characteristics and prescriptive form for an application. Arrange your things like this, and it will make sense have these characteristics in your application and it will make sense. But I think software design kind of has more axes than just functional patterns and large-scale architectures, right, one or the other. And I think the most interesting stuff is the stuff that falls in the cracks in between because that's the moment-to-moment, -moment, line to line way that most programmers interact with their code. So here's a, here's a horrible deep confession, and it might not be a surprise to anyone from the look of me, that back in time I was a pure art student, way, way back in time, right? Like in the, I literally studied literature and philosophy and politics and history and then the computer science degree. Why would you do that? I always wanted to be a programmer. That's the truth. I always wanted to be a programmer. I thought there was this kind of um, ineffable magic about what we do, about making things that's so fucking cool, right? And I never, never lost that addiction from the first time I saw something that I did change on the screen. But for the first half of my career, I really, really struggled to reconcile the aesthetic sensibilities of design. You know, I started programming in the mid-1990s. There were no websites. There were just a few books. Um, and these books, right, these really scientific, textbook-style, formal language, design pattern -y books, these two things just didn't match in my head because I got into programming because I wanted to make games like every 10-year-old does, right? That's the truth. So... I kind of, I went to university and I was, I was feeling a little bit disillusioned in my first year and I stumbled across, you know, Donald Knuth, right? But anyone else done a computer science degree in here? No computer science degrees? One person. Anyone heard of The Art of Computer Programming, the book? Right. So the interesting thing, so Donald, Donald Knuth wrote this book called um, Literate Programming way back in 1984, um, which is literally the year I was born, so there are no new ideas. So Nuth had this idea of programming being um, a thing that should be formed of a documentation language and a programming language. And you're like, what? Okay. So I continued reading. And he was really focused on the idea of comprehensible code. And, you know, he, he, he really he wrote this whole, this whole book called Literate Programming. And it, this is really consistent with Donald Nuth. So Donald Nuth is the man that's been working on the art of computer programming since the 70s, I think, maybe 60s who took 10 years out to build techs 
the formatting language so he could write the book about computer programming for which he made up a fake microprocessor architecture and a fake programming language so he could teach what computer programming was meant to be from the purest possible philosophical position. It's like, cool, cool. I mean, I, I respect the hustle. It's just a bit of a slow hustle. But like this, this book that he wrote about literate programming I thought was really, really awesome. And it just, it stuck with me because he was really, really focused on this idea that programming languages and documentation languages were this symbiotic <coughs> thing that gave context to code. Now, if you think about it, when he started writing this book in the 70s, all the programming languages at the time were far lower level than the languages we use today. I was going to say sucked, but they didn't really suck. They were just very primitive. They were very close to the metal. And actually, modern programming languages over time have dragged themselves both to higher order abstractions and to be more like the written word year by year by year. And we, we keep on going, right? And actually, I was reading this and thinking, Donald Knuth was right in that programming languages are kind of now this amalgam of documentation and implementation language that we smush together. Like most programming languages didn't support the concept of comments in the 70s as, a, as an example. So programming languages have kind of trended towards being more literate over time. But this idea that software should be looked at through the lens of literature really, really, really stuck with me because it is the same. And it was kind of a little bit of a revelation, like a light bulb moment for baby programmer art student David who had spent time studying English literature. Like, oh, God, this is a text. Of course it is. You know, it changed the way I started writing code, but just like literature, software only becomes good if you focus on its form as well as its function. Light bulb moment. So, over the years, I've come to this really precise definition of what I believe software really is. I believe software is a constrained form of communication between programmer and programmer that describes concepts and problems that just so happens to be executed by machines by accident. It's almost like a happy side effect that we managed to do this. What we're really doing is we're describing a problem space in a constrained language. That's really like good writing. And the more you think about it, the more it starts to click. You spend so much longer, of a larger portion of your working day reading code than you do write it. Your code exists in a context. It has subtext. It has authorial intent. Sometimes it has unreliable narrators when the intent of the author isn't manifested and you end up with bugs. All of these idioms we use for literature can be applied to software. Your code, your code has form. It has flow. It has a rhythm, just like any other writing. But most importantly, your code has reason, it has intent, it has a purpose for being. So this, um, everyone talks about clean code, but like this has nothing to do with clean code really. You know, the, the, the problem with that book is the first three chapters are just the sentence name variables well, over about 5,000 words. Um, it's a really, god-awful, ob obviously terrible book that's cast this horrible long shadow over software and reduced all discussions of design to like, oh, have you got your variables named right? Have you split things up into small functions? It's just, it's really dogmatic. It doesn't actually help anybody, and the, the back half of it is all complete garbage and was from the day it was published about dead Java frameworks. I'd just burn it, honestly. Now, I always say this, and everyone, you know, Everyone's like, oh my God, heresy, how could you say that about clean code? That was the most important book. I mean, me too. Right, me too. And, and actually, at one point in my career, I thought rules about basic hygiene were the same as design. <laughs> but they're not, right? I, I, I've come to value this idea of intentionality over any concept of kind of cleanliness and, and syntactic conciseness, I guess. Um, you know, I, someone asked me a question when I've done this talk previously, like, oh, but, you know, clean code has its place in time. And I think that's true. You know, I think 15 years ago when that book came out, there was very, very little in the space that even tried to approach some of these topics. And there's a little bit of, of gratitude we have for someone kind of introducing these concepts into that conversation. But I just think it's aged very, very badly. So when I talk about intentionality, let me, let me tell you what I really mean. Um, it means every character matters. Literally, every single thing you type, you have to type for a reason, and everything matters, just like in writing. And when I, when I think about software, I want to approach the work as if it all matters, 
the white space matters, the rhythm in the code matters, the form, the naming, the function, they're all important, right? Code written with that kind of thoughtfulness and intentionality and respect for the reader is what matters to me. I think that's what makes software good. And we're going to go into detail, don't worry, not just stay in the abstract. So the interesting thing is when you start thinking of your code as literature, you start valuing different ways of communicating in code than you did before. Now, we can communicate on the macro scale with kind of large-scale organizational patterns. So the, the, the classic example that lots of people have used before is MVC. Anyone made an MVC application before? Right, everybody. Were they all websites? Yeah, yeah, every single one of them. So the interesting thing about MVC is it's an organizational pattern that obscures the intent of your code completely. If I open a code base that is an MVC website, all I see is, cool, you built a website. There's nothing about the structure or the form or the flow of that code base that actually tells you what the website does or what it's about. There's nothing present in that organizational pattern. But it so neatly maps to the idiom of web development that actually it's kind of okay, right? Like it, it works well in that context. But it's constrained, it's compromised. Um, so I actually find the micro scale, again, more interesting, where the, the way that you form specific pieces of code on a function-to-function, module-by-module way, telegraphs intent. Because f form and flow are the tools we have to increase cohesion in a code base. And let me use an example here to illustrate this. So when I say use form and flow and cohesion, I want you to take a look at this screenshot first, and we're going to look at a second one. Now, you don't need to understand every line of code here. It's basically a nonsense. It's a nothing, right? There's some HTTP stuff and some error response, null checking, right? Whatever. But it's difficult to read because there is no form and there is no flow and there is no organization in that function at all. What it does is it forces you as the programmer to comprehend every line statement by statement and build up a mental model in your head where your head computing what's happening. So we use paragraphs in the English language to group related concepts. So code is the same. This is using form and flow in a piece of code. Lines mean something. They carry meaning. If you use them everywhere or nowhere, you're removing like an entire category of expression. Weird. So this, incre this is like a really, really incredibly small scale example to illustrate the difference. And, you know, it, it makes me think that, you know, good form in good code, like it reads like it's a rhythm. It's like poetry. You're telling a reader, but, but, but I do this and this and this and I breathe and I pause. And now I do this, and I breathe, and I pause, and I do this, and I breathe, and I pause. It's diction. Um, so it's, it's what happens when an aesthetic sensibility matches the intent of the content of the work. And all I really did was delete a few lines of code. <laughs> like I deleted a few empty lines to make it easier to comprehend. And you know, form and flow then become something you use to communicate intent. You're directing the reader. And, you know, the, the truth is things like this are often lost in the morass of kind of linters and things like that. Like languages that rely on linters over static analysis, hello JavaScript, um, often butcher a category of expression in the code because they're dictatorial about form. The same goes if, if we've got any Go programmers in the room. No? The thing about Go as a, as a language is it's got very, very strict rules around form. So every Go program you look at looks the same. Same with Clojure. Every closure program looks like a lot of brackets and nesting. And you have to really, really read and comprehend everything in your head to grab the intent of the piece. So form is important because it's design. Now, the more you start thinking about software through this lens of kind of form and flow and, and literature and more importantly design, it became apparent that I was really trying to, I was, I was reacting to the inherent complexity in a lot of modern software development, really. And, and that is actually a, a design problem more than anything. So I've been working on a sentence recently. <laughs> That's what I do now. I don't write software. I, I write sentences. <laughs> this is the real thing that makes me mad in all of software in the world, I believe. So the complexity of your application should be at most as complex as the problem space it inhabits and no greater. And the amount of software that fails that sniff test is remarkable, right? They, they, they lose themselves under infrastructure and 300 build pipelines and, uh, and, and Git submodules and like a thousand different categories of test suites. And it's just like, where the fuck is the software? 
in the middle of all of this absolute chaff. Like it feels sometimes like trying to find a needle in the haystack, right? And it's a shame, right? Like, and because all of those things are these kind of grand designs about an eventual destination and quality and focus, and they're all people trying to do good things, but losing the message on the way. And actually, focusing on the correct form to express the problem space they have now and the scale of the problems they have now would be much more valuable to that piece of software than all of the stuff around it. Like, it makes working in systems like that kind of like swimming through treacle. It's almost like since the popularization of microservice architectures, we forgot how to build nice small things, you know? And nice small things are beautiful. I think the best software we have is kind of the antithesis of that statement. It's software that is smaller, more beautiful, and concise that contains a larger problem space than you think it could possibly manage, right? That's, that's beautiful design. Now, the interesting thing about kind of software design is that even the use of the word design here is probably contentious because I, I appreciate that a lot of programmers don't perceive themselves to be visual people, right? It's a, it's a trope. It's not true, but it's a trope. So designs as a, uh, exist specifically to solve problems and communicate intent using form and function. That's what design is. People often confuse design with art Art is the thing we use to express ourselves to cope with the human condition. There are commonalities between those two things, but they are not the same, right? So let's, we're not thinking about art, we're not thinking about making things pretty, we're thinking about design and communication. So the interesting thing about design is it's really temporal in nature. Well, those are really blown out color palettes on those slides. So these are two really, really iconic pieces, and I do not believe I'm about to say this, of period design. <laughs> Uh, we're all old. Um, and the interesting thing about this is then they're both nonsense now. Like those designs don't mean anything to people that were not there at the time and didn't use them, precisely because designs are temporal and exist in a context. Right? And, and same with software, right? So there's, there's this really interesting observation, actually, these two iconic designs weren't really the last of their lines at all, and people look at them and think they're obsolete things. But actually, they both evolved and changed. Now, that's because fundamental to the concept of design is the concept of iteration. Phones didn't cease to exist. Walkmans didn't cease to exist. They both were iterated out to touch phones and mobile phones and discmans and iPods. And the really like irony, irony, maybe fascinating artifact of these two designs is they converged. Two completely disparate things converged because we realized the real problem we were trying to solve was the transmission of audio and not making phone calls or listening to, you know, banging Led Zeppelin albums or something. Like, they were different things, and they converged. And I think this is really inherent, this evolutionary process that underpins great design. And, and the nice thing about that is it really exactly is the same reason that some of the disciplines we have in software development that are fundamentally off software, like TDD, getting cast as design totally makes sense, right? The, the reason TDD makes sense as design is it's fundamentally an iterative process that involves you building context over time. Super, super fascinating, right? And, you know, I know there's a trend at the moment of people to kind of criticize TDD and its utility on the internet, but I can tell you one thing for certain. Any of the people that post big screeds about TDD being wrong have never used it for iterative design. I'll tell you exactly what they did. They wrote a test, they made it passed, and they moved on. Cool. First two steps of a three-step process. Gold star, right? Most of the people that criticize TDD haven't really used it to realize design, right? They just, they never really did it. They didn't do the refact, they didn't do the cycle. And it also kind of highlights this other magical quality of design as a discipline that a lot of this kind of thinking about the form of things leads you to, which is like, there are entire categories of problems that exist in the world that are completely invisible to you until you can observe them visually. It's like, a, it's a funny quirk. And again, this trips up a lot of people that don't think of themselves as visual people, but we've all had that experience of opening up a software library and kind of, you know, in C Sharp, you're, you're IntelliSense in your way through a library, and you're just like, why are the APIs structured like this? This is like, this is horrible, right? That's you having a vicious response to the design of their API. And that's precisely what a pattern like TDD and its red-green refactor, red-green refactor is meant to put front and center in the, in the code editor of the author as they're writing it. 
Right, there's this really great um, anecdote about when they were first filming Star Wars. And it was one of the Star Wars sequels. And you, you know how like all the Star Wars films after the 80s sucked? And it's because the scripts were very bad, right? Funny story, George Lucas was married to a very, very famous script editor in the 70s and 80s, and they got divorced between then and the, the ones with the bad scripts. And there's a story about, um, I think they were filming the final of the original films, and Harrison Ford is doing retakes. And it's because George Lucas is such a bad script writer, after about 30 takes, he's like, George, you can write this shit, but you can't say it, and he storms off set. And that's exactly the same thing that happens when people have a design in their head, but don't express it visually and allow them so themselves the kind of the space and time to take it in and respond to how it feels to use, right? That's kind of the software equivalent. Um, so I don't think it's you know, categorically impossible to, to come up with some good APIs without like iterating them and seeing them, but the, the odds are completely stacked against you. And all you're really doing is cutting yourself off from an entire set of feedback. So I guess with this kind of stuff in mind and looking at this framing device as software design as just regular design, it's probably worth us thinking about the context that some of our software is built in today versus the context of the software that was built at the time kind of the Gang of Four books were written, right? It, it challenges some of the more classical works of the genre. We're not building desktop software anymore. We're, programming languages have made categories of problems obsolete. Most languages have kind of functions as data. Um, a lot of those kinds of patterns are now gone and we don't need them anymore because we evolved much like the disk and the, water and the telephone evolved into modern smartphones. And that's beautiful, actually. Now, now I guess the thing is, when, when I start to say things like this, all the 10th generation clean architecture folks just like really, really hate it, right? They, they, most of the things that, and I'm, I'm sorry in advance, most all of the things that you think are best practice are just things that fit your aesthetic sensibility one time. They're things you saw work once. They're just basically overblown structural design patterns most of the time. And they kind of look as stupid as the organization by technical concept example from the start when you zoom out. It's, it's a bit of a, I don't know, it's a weird bummer. Like lots of system design these days gets, gets caught up into this kind of decomposition, clean architecture, everything is, everything is ports and adapters kind of pattern. And you know most systems have been atomized into these big, Microservices, who am I kidding? They're all distributed monoliths. You do know that, right? If I kick one over and the system goes down, it's not the thing. Um, I jest. But people describe all that stuff as best practice, right? As best practice without saying on what axis, in what context, for what use, for what people, right? Like there's no such thing. Best practice is a lie, it doesn't exist. So I want to show you another example where the overall picture looks fine when zoomed out, but when you zoom into the detail, we're, we're living in the divine comedy. Um, so this is an application that I was helping people fix recently. Again, you do not have to read the words, just look at the number of boxes, right? It, this is like a classic prescriptive, clean architecture, like handcuffing conundrum. But all I actually see here is like the telltale signs of complete thoughtlessness, right? So what this is, is, a system which we were trying to fix up because it had build times of like 20 minutes and it was like it was an API the whole thing was just an API but there were like 13 C sharp projects with then 13 common uh, direct dependency libraries underneath it for their core business logic BL yeah and then a common library between them and then a library like a core library that the common library and the applications depended on I'm just like is all this and then I look at the 13 build pipelines right one for each application times three environments test solutions each distinct for each of the things so it was basically like 64 66 C sharp projects in one solution and the grand grand irony was all of those like 13 <clears throat> times three whatever that number is 929 build pipelines we're all taking these applications putting them onto the same physical machine the same load balancer in front of them. So they were served as one app. And I walked in and I basically table flipped. She said, like, why are you hurting yourselves? This whole thing was maintained by one team of four people. And I'm just like, who is, who is this for? 
Like, is this performance art? Is this like, who, why are you harming yourselves? You're sitting here. And they came to me because, oh, David, the build times are long. Yeah, that's your problem. Cool, cool. That's what you think the problem is. So <laughs> the total cognitive load of understanding this and all of those moving parts, which honestly, I think were well-intentioned. People did what they thought was right and what they were meant to do because they were given a right answer. It was all done by this single team. And the irony is, I opened up some of the code files and we went through a cleaning process later on. Everything started looking like the thing on the left became something that looked like the thing on the right. They totally neglected the actual internal hygiene of the code base in their craving for these large-scale organizational patterns. Everything looked good from 20,000 feet, gold star. But like, what this really is in my eyes is people focusing on macro design rather than the moment-to-moment -moment form and flow of code. And it's horrible, and you know, the truth is, I, I'm, I'm over-dramatizing this. These were good people doing well-intentioned work who I like very much, but I see stuff like this all the time. Yeah, I worked for 15 years as an independent consultant, and like, so much software looks like this. So how did we spot and fix this, right? What we did is we first rounded, did a, like a trim of complexity. So we collapsed all the families of modules, rolling them together. So each web app had one direct dependency. We just mushed those together. We literally cut and pasted the code into the same assembly. Cool, instantly halved the footprint of the system. We then merged the test assemblies, halved the footprint of the, the test code base. And then all I did is I copied all of the files into one app and deployed it 13 times and just left all the firewall rules to map as if it was different apps. And then once we knew that worked, we deleted everything else. And then we had one app, and that was it. And it took us 10 days, really, chainsaws out to fix, 17 second build time. <laughs> because all that was really happening was they were dying on the font of IO, right? Like disks spin at a certain speed, you, you can't copy megabytes and megabytes of binaries and dependencies 64 times without it costing you something. And, and I think it was all this kind of well-intentioned, high-order thinking that just, I don't know, they forgot how software worked in the mix. And the team were really grateful, and they were like, oh, God, this is really obvious now. And then, then I left it with them, and they could use their refactoring tools to quickly clean up the code base. And they could go through, and it was, it was good, and everything was co-located. Because what they had at the start was obviously one system, right? And I think all of this talk of kind of decomposition and clean architecture has dragged us to this place where we are motivated to pull everything apart without thinking that like, you know, scalability comes at specific costs, right? You separate things and you buy a cost every time. So if you just do it for fun, you're getting nothing. So yeah, that was what it looked like <laughs> at the end, which is objectively, objectively very funny. Build smaller things. So let's talk about the opposite. Let, let's negate my argument. There are, of course, certain problem spaces where there are well-known good structural design patterns. So the most glaringly obvious example is kind of RPC-style systems like HTTP APIs that often map quite neatly to things like command query patterns. Right? They're, they're good, right? They're fine. But the truth is, in those systems, using well-known good patterns actually makes the form and the flow and the organization of your components even more important. Because in any design where you make lots and lots of things look the same, getting the bits that are different to be obvious is your challenge, right? I suppose what I'm reaching for is it's not just what you say, but it's also how you say it. And it matters because when your macro level design is comfortable, people skim read, right? Just like you would skim read in text if people were, were waffling in written word, you just skim past the content and you miss the detail. And I think this is really the, the central problem with well-known good designs, is that like, it's really easy to learn a design pattern or two, and then, and we've all been there, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And everything in the world looks like that thing you know all of a sudden. So let me tell you about mistakes I have made in my career. We, we, we can feel like we're all in the same boat together. So I learned about MVC, and I thought everything was a controller. <laughs> Uh, I learned about aspect-oriented programming, and I thought everything was chains of interceptors. Um, I learned about pipelines and thought everything was a pipeline with you know, the, the middleware patterns. Um, I had a tech lead tell me that, oh, controllers only ever talk HTTP, no business logic. So then I thought everything was an application service. 
And then, obviously, when microservice design first got popular, I thought everything was a microservice. I have made many of those mistakes in my career, all of them repeatedly. And it takes time to learn that uniformity is actually the opposite of expressiveness. And it's important that when different parts of your software do something different, that their form reflects their difference, that they look different, that they cause you to stop and jolt and change your approach. Visual variation leads the eye. It encourages reading instead of skim reading. Now, intentionality is really the, the opposite of complexity in, in my mind. It's the stop doing things just because, stop cargo culting. Um, I guess the thing I try and coach my teams when, when I'm doing like a, a pairing code review is like, if you don't understand why you've made a, a particular choice, don't make it. Like, don't make it until you can justify that library or that particular API or that approach. If you're just doing it because it's there, you're, you're probably wrong or you'll be wrong later. Um, I guess the reason that people make these quick choices is because so much of software is context sensitive that there are so many times where blindly applying a design pattern makes software more difficult to reason about. And our job when we're designing software is fundamentally this war of complexity. So one of the things that strikes me when we talk about complexity is I'm a little bit shocked at what things people think are complex versus what things people don't think are complex problems. So I read this really, really great book a year or two ago. Um, so the book is called A Philosophy of Software Design by a man called John K. Oosterhout, who is a university lecturer who runs programming courses as if they are literature courses, where he has people come in with their code and he'll do a critique and a marking and they'll come back and they'll revise them, like drafts. And he has this great chapter, I think it's chapter three in this book, which really gets to the heart of why complexity is a problem in software. Now, Complexity is anything related to the structure of a software system that makes it hard to understand or modify the system. It sounds simple and obvious, but it's correct. And it's the central theme of this chapter that complexity isn't caused by like a single catastrophic error in your design generally. It's the tiny paper cuts that accumulate over time. It's kind of like depression and happiness. Depression will get you like a little bit, but you'll forget the happy bits, right? Because they're not quite as, as moving in the moment. It's, it, it comes in from this collection of dependencies, obscurities, and idiosyncrasies at work, is what he says. So he describes complexity as the thing that leads to what the, this, this thing called change amplification. High cognitive load and unknown unknowns, leading to an explosion of work and effort so that the number of modifications it takes to build a piece of software exponentially increases with each added feature. That's how you know what complexity is. And actually, when you build on that definition, you think about it, there's lots of categories of things that are complexity that you don't realize. Um, I think thoughtful design is kind of the salve for this. But there's this distressing realization when you start thinking in this way. You know, design patterns precisely got so popular because it gives people a way to reach towards something that they feel is good. It's like it's that, um, that teacher's pet high school thing where you've got a good known reference answer. You know, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. I used the right design pattern, technical leader. I did a good job. Please appreciate my work. But software doesn't really have many definite conclusions in, in it, really. And, and once you've seen enough code bases in enough languages, you, you start to realize that most of the arbitrary stylistic qualities of code that people <coughs> fixate on, tabs versus spaces, brace style, mostly irrelevant. Right, actually mostly irrelevant. They're all um, taste, really. But instead, you, I, I've ended up focusing on these non-negotiable qualities that I look for in code bases that I think are far less regimented than a style guide, right? I think good code is code that's easy for someone with minimal domain context to read, right? Code that your average developer can understand is good code by definition. It's a communication form. Code that focuses on developer experience, Productivity, debuggability, and usability. Code that you cannot debug and you cannot change is bad code. Doesn't matter how smart it is under the hood. Code where the intent takes up more of the visual space than the language constructs and syntax is good code. So code where you see all of the flow control and none of the logic is code that's hard to maintain. So where you bury your functionality under language features and ceremony. <clears throat> 
And the truth is, regardless of kind of language, style, in, or, or intent, all programmers interact with code bases the same way, right? We open it up and we glance at it and then we deep dive and we read through it. That's the workflow that you always have to optimize with to actually write good code. And good code by, any met by those metrics makes that job easy. So at this meta level, all code is constructed from abstractions and encapsulation, the two things that we have. And regardless of programming or era, this has always been true. So the programming languages and runtimes and frameworks and operating systems that you write higher level code in today goes through an enormous amount of compilation and translation and there's, there's, there's a million bits of everything between your user land code and the metal that you run on at the bottom. And you know, programming languages themselves are common abstractions over operating system APIs, which, are, which offer abstractions over assembly languages and microarchitectures and hardware drivers. And you know, this, this trend continues upwards into the functions that you write and the types you define, right? So for the most part, we are blissfully unaware that all of this stuff is happening underneath us. But I want to use a, an example for you that, that illustrates what makes a good piece of design, right? So you never have to worry about what happens when you call file open. And if you ever, you know, it's a bit of a, like, I'm 14 and high and this is deep. If you ever thought about what happens when you do file open, <laughs> Like, there's so much stuff that happens underneath that call in every programming language, right? You have operating, pro programming language APIs, operating system APIs, device drivers for multiple different categories of storage, be they spinning disks, solid state drives, memory, SSD trimming commands, file systems, different kinds of file systems, partitioning, all that stuff exists in the file open API but you never have to comprehend it because that API reduces the cognitive load on the user, right? So when we, when we dig deep into this, you can apply that same logic to any, any module, right? And Anusterhout calls this concept the, the idea of a deep or a shallow module when he deals with complexity. He says that the modules of any kind, be they packages or APIs, things that reduce complexity are deep modules and things that amplify complexity are shallow modules, right? So deep modules are modules that offer a huge amount of benefit for a very, very narrow API. File open is exactly a perfect example of a deep module. The inverse is then also true. Libraries and modules offer minimal benefit with very, very expensive APIs, expose your application to an explosion of complexity. Not because you're using it all, but you could be. Therefore, the, the job on you to comprehend what's happening when you interact with that module, so much greater, right? So as much a factor of avoiding the wrong abstractions as finding kind of the right ones. So generally, any module of code you find should contain a problem space in its entirety. That's what you're aiming to do, contain an entire domain. And you're not meant to leak any details of the implementation of that domain upwards, right? So it means that abstractions that include things like pass-through methods. Pass-through methods have become one of my like, biggest massive red flags in code bases. Because by those definitions of deep and shallow modules, you're exposed to the 100% of the surface area of the abstraction underneath you. And you don't give it a language or provide any um, creature comforts or syntactic sugar to reduce that complexity. So you're literally just amplifying the noise from the thing above and adding just junk on top of it. So delete all of those wrapper classes, right? Unless you're doing something meaningful. Um, the other tell is that good deep modules never expose types that they actually use in their implementation. Because the types that they use in their implementation should be a, a lower order than the way that they describe the output of that thing to contain the complexity. So all of a sudden, like, I, I read this chapter, and I sat and I, I properly thought about it for about a week. I was like, ah, actually, all of these categories of things that I see in the software, the things that give me the ick, that's what it is. That's the reason why I don't like these functions. That's the reason why these things are easy to use. Super, super useful. And I, you know, I think our software is kind of riddled with thoughtless abstraction and poor encapsulation. And every time a design decision like that is made, it decreases the reason a module exists, right? Um, so anything that adds a large amount of boilerplate to your system, bad code. And you all already knew that, but that's why. Now, 
I guess you get to a certain point where you realize that all talk about design dissolves into discussion of dogma and absolutism, right? Because I tell you the one true thing I know about software design, and I'll do this. My job title is Distinguished Engineer, Head of Architecture. Let me tell you what I think about software architecture. There's no good design. There is no one design. There isn't one. It doesn't exist. Not true. It doesn't depend. It doesn't exist. And any design, when you stretch it to its logical, absolute extreme, becomes absurd, right? So the one true thing I can tell you is if someone says they have the right design for everything, the only thing I can tell you for a fact is that they are wrong. It doesn't exist. So designing software with intention, software that survives, is an exercise in compromise. It's always an exercise in context. It's always an exercise in trade-off. And it's why everyone with any experience in software design basically just says, it depends, right? It depends. How should I? Well, it depends on what? Well, how many users? What context? What cost? How many people? When are you going to change it? What does it do? There's about 30 different lenses you have to look through your software at to understand what it depends on, to find that good design. And you know, a lot of the poor trade-offs you will see in software uh, really involve people actively not understanding the sources of complexity in their own systems. And that leads to weird design, doing things like taking additional dependencies, packages or services, for like single, simple use cases. You know, there's a lot to be said about maintaining 30 lines of code that you own, rather than a package you have to deal with versioning and security compliance and God knows what else to solve one thing. And you know, all dependencies have surface areas. So if you take a package, all of a sudden you've exposed your application to all that dependencies complexity. Now, it's interesting because that, that sentiment, I'll just write it yourself, is directly at odds with the other well-known and common correct sentiment of, well, the best amount of code you can write is no code, right? The less you can write, the better, because the less you have to maintain. But the truth is, you know, every line of code you adopt is also code you own. And I think that's where it gets lost. Like, cool, depend on a package, but that's your responsibility, right? You know? So something more constrained with a smaller surface area pushes less complexity into your application sometimes. And that's kind of really the thing. You know, the available potential surface area of code that you are exposed to is where complexity flows from. So I'll give you a really practical example. Um, I recently spent four hours trying to evaluate every static site generator to make a four-page website and gave up and wrote a 30-line program instead. Right? Because each one of them was flagged as experimental or used a weird view engine or like God knows what, dependency hell, NPM chaos. And I just thought, you know what, I can write a program that does everything I need to do and I will never have to update it and it's fine because I'm building a four page website. Right? I just needed it to read some markdown files. I could write that. Simpler. So this is all about kind of the idea of having your designs continually being part of a trade-off. And what, what you end up with is instead of hard rules and good designs, you end up with tests, like psychological tests that you apply to design to find out whether something is good or bad. Um, and I want to take you through a few tests that I use to evaluate designs um, to help people find the right answer for them. So this is my favorite one. Could you do the thing you're doing with less moving parts? Less moving parts, generally better, because less things can go wrong when there are less moving parts. And that, again, feels like a, a, a contradiction of like split your software up into small pieces, but it isn't. Moving parts are process boundaries, microservices, failable parts. It's actually kind of better to have a system that fails as a unit than fails as lots of individual components if it's the same people that have to diagnose the whole thing, right? Because you can, you can diagnose that locally if it's a single unit. Um, there are many places in our ecosystem where ballooning complexity makes working with our software just harder. So we should never extract things from our application to somewhere else just because. Like, it comes with a cost. You're making a repository, you're making build pipelines, you have release cycles, you have patches and support, you have people that have to be on call. As soon as you snap a thing out, that's a whole category of problems you just created. Sometimes it's the right answer, but do it meaningfully. Make a choice that's informed. Is this operable in a production environment? Like so many times I've seen systems that have really asinine, weird, esoteric requirements of their operating and runtime. This is getting better over time, mostly because cloud vendors are forcing people into very, very narrow boxes, which is on average a good thing. Um, software systems that are hard to observe, deploy, and manage are basically dead. 
they're bad software, right? Things should be built to reduce operational burden always. Is it easy to change? Here's a truism for you. The only thing I can tell you that you will definitely do with your software is change it at some point, right? So software is hard, that is hard to change is bad software. Um, and what that means is you should really avoid over-design up front. It's a little bit of like the, the, the classic Yagni, you ain't gonna need it, right? Design what you need for now, because you know, we require designs that are easier to modify rather than the premature optimization of extensible frameworks and libraries. And as programmers, we always get dragged towards building a framework or a library because it feels like the thing you should do. The vast majority of those extension points as someone that has done this time and time again in his career and never used. Build with them in mind, but don't implement them at the start. And I guess what I'm really advocating for here, I suppose, when I plead for intentionality, is for you to write software with care and purpose. Um, you know, there was a, I had an exchange with someone that I, that I worked with recently about some error messages I'd, I'd built. And like, my, my school of error message writing, which I learned from, does anyone remember Ninject? The really good DI container. Now, Nate Kahari, who wrote Ninject, wrote the best error messages I have ever seen in my entire career. Because you do something wrong with Ninject, it's like, cool, I failed to do this. Here are the three different things I tried. Here's the stack traces from each one of them. I think you should probably try this to resolve it. And here's a link to the documentation where we talk about this concept and this error. And I'm like, cool, masterclass in error writing, because it's, you know, it's not just teaching someone a fish, it's throwing them a box of fish at the same time. Um, and I try and write error messages like that. It's like, hi, you're here because you're missing some environment variables. Here are the environment variables you're missing. You probably need to make a file here, or you need to put them in this setting here. If you're on Linux, do this instead. But you give them all the information in the software. It's the right place for it to be. And I think that kind of care and purpose, I, like I jokingly describe it as like, write, write error messages like you're in love with the person that's gonna read them and you don't wanna ruin their day, right? Like it's a gentle human thing. And I want you to think about that kind of design of your software. And I want you to think about the reader. I want you to think about what form and flow do to your application. And I want you to realize that sometimes that reader you're thinking about is you, right? It's fine. And I want you to use all of the forms of expression you have available in your code base to communicate meaning and intent. In, in different you know, problem spaces and different solutions, we require different aesthetic viewpoints and different designs, and that's okay. That's a good thing. Otherwise, we're damning ourselves for the rest of our careers just being either an MVC app or everything is a big bunch of HTTP calls, or I suppose the, the third magic category of like everything is just some React components, right? The three designs. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. Because I believe that when you put the thought into your code base, the care shows, right? So I was on a podcast a couple of years ago, and you know at the end of podcasts, they always ask you that, like, that one kind of gotcha question to try and, try and elicit a response. And they just did the classic, oh, what would you say to yourself 25 years ago when you were getting started? What, what advice would you give to yourself? And I think I know the answer now. I think I do. Take more time. Take more time over everything. And I think the best software that I have ever wrote, where the care that I put into it shows, is where I finish. And I put a CD on, and I pour myself a, put a CD on, put Spotify on, um, pour myself a drink. And I sit and I read it. And I read it obsessively, and I read every line, and I think, why did I do that? Why did I make that choice? Why did I make that decision? Why that API? Why that form? Why that organizational pattern? And if I can't explain it to myself, I know I will not be able to explain it to somebody else, and I change it. And sometimes I change it, and I don't like what I see, and we go back to where I was because I think that's the better compromise. And that's okay. But giving myself that 20% extra time at the end of everything to really take it in. And you know, I think in this kind of world that we live in where people are, are dragged into endless bike shedding, pull request kind of machine gun fights with each other, Actually, it's a little bit of a kindness to yourself because like at that point, no one's got anything on you in a pull request, right? Like you've, you, you've had that fight with yourself a hundred times, so you know why you're there. Um, and I think all software that's built with that degree of kind of care and love for the work means that we just never stop asking why. I love it. Like, and I think if I drag us all the way back to the start where I said like I was an art student, like as far as I'm concerned, the software we build, although it kind of gets dragged into these kind of bleak commercial settings for money and survival, 
It's our work. It's the thing we have when all this is done. If I were a painter, I would have paintings. When I finish this, I have software, so it better be what, something I am proud of. That's kind of how I feel about it, like, deeply. So, I want to leave you with a few reading recommendations. This is the, the slide to actually take photos of, um, partially because I don't think there are many books talking about this kind of design, but there are a couple I have loved here. Um, so that first, the, the philosophy of software design, it, it is a truly, truly brilliant book, and I think the best work in this area. Code That Fits in Your Head by Mark Seaman, very, very new, I think it's three months old, talks about a lot of really, really practical, applicable tips for your software, and, and deals with a lot of these kind of existential crises you find on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And then Your Code as a Crime Scene um, by Adam Tornhill, um, really, really foundational work of a former forensic psychologist who talks about understanding the knowledge flow of your software through like doing analysis of commits and how knowledge flows between people and check-ins. Super, super interesting. Um, brilliant books, support authors that do interesting work, please. And that has been me. That has been me. This is the talk, fuck it, it depends, I guess, basically. <laughs> that should have been the title. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Oh, that's a lot. Sorry, I know it's a lot. It's a lot, and I know there's not much code, but please, green, green in the box makes makes them make me come back and get rained on next year. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>